The latest travel warnings after a deadly kidnapping in Mexico. A man hit and killed while he was changing a tire on the side of the freeway will hear from his family. And is daylight saving time about to become permanent? We verify. An animal sanctuary in the San Bernardino Mountains is snowed in. How the San Diego Humane Society is helping to get food to their animals. A military hero did not return home from war. More than 50 years later, his daughter watched his forgotten footage of her father. CBS 8 News Live at 6 starts now. Two Americans are back in the U.S. at a hospital after surviving an abduction in Mexico. Two other Americans were killed. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Marcella Lee. I'm Carlo Chiquetto. One person is in custody tonight, and we're learning more about the survivors. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen tells us how this incident is also putting the spotlight on new travel warnings for Mexico. <laughs> This video was captured as four Americans were involved in a kidnapping that turned deadly during a cartel shootout near the northern Mexico border city of Matamoros. Now travel warnings are in the spotlight. A level four do not travel warning, the highest travel warning given by the State Department is in effect for Tamalupa, state where Matamoros is located. U.S. government employees have been instructed to avoid the area until further notice. Baja California is at level three, a reconsider travel to warning due to crime and kidnapping. Well, it's terrifying to see that cartels have the power to sort of stop traffic. I spoke with Leela Abed, the deputy director of the Mexico Institute at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. The U.S. Department of State has uh, released and, and placed a warning on the state of Tamaulipas in addition to five other states in the country, a no travel warning given the, the large amounts of crime and kidnapping that occur in, in the state as well as in other parts of Mexico. I also spoke with Ev Mead, a former UCSD and USD professor who specializes in studies of violence, migration, and peace. He says while this is a terrifying circumstance, it shouldn't stop people from traveling to Mexico. This was a pretty rare event. Um, it almost never happens, actually. But I always think that these are opportunities to open a broader conversation about what's going on in Mexico. However, former FBI hostage rescue team member Rob D'Amico advises to not travel to Mexico. But he says if you are willing to take that risk, be cautious. Situational awareness is the most important thing. Understanding your surroundings. It's, it's not like you're walking down your street, so don't have your head down in your phone. Read before you go. Again, all the travel warnings that State Department puts out and, and everything you can get about that area, you have to find out about. Meanwhile, the Biden administration says it's closely following the situation and coordinating with Mexican authorities. To bring the individuals that caused this to justice, which is ultimately very hard in Mexico because of the deep corruption of public officials. We have a full list of travel warnings in Mexico on CBS8.com. Ariana Cohen, CBS8. Thank you, Ariana. And coming up tonight in our second half hour, we'll have more on the two Americans killed in Mexico, the two survivors, and what we're learning about that violent kidnapping south of the Texas border. Right now, we've got some breaking news out of National City. We've just learned that a National City teacher voted Teacher of the Year has been arrested, accused of sexual misconduct with a former student under 14. Jackie Ma teaches sixth grade at Lincoln Acres. The school sent out a letter to the entire district, the community, saying that the student no longer goes to that school and the arrest took place on campus, but not in front of any students. Ma is due to be arraigned on Thursday. Prosecutors say a recent college graduate was high on marijuana when she hit and killed a man who was changing his tire in the center median. CBS 8's Anna Laurel was in the Vista courtroom when the accused driver pleaded not guilty today, and she talked to the victim's family. I spoke with Rafael Cardona's family late this afternoon just inside the courthouse. They say they are still in disbelief that their brother is dead, hit and killed while he was changing a tire on the side of the freeway. He was a good man. A uh, helpful man, Christian man. Uh, he was like an angel to us in the family. Rafael Cardona was one of six brothers and a sister. His brother Beto says he lived in Oceanside and every Sunday he drove to Tijuana. He usually does that on Sundays, go to f see the family, take some food and stuff and go to church over there. 
But when Rafael didn't show up to go to church February 26, they knew something was wrong. Authorities say around 10:20 that Sunday morning, Rafael was changing his tire in the center median of the 78 at Emerald Drive when another car hit and killed him. He was pronounced dead at the scene. And do you waive formal reading? Yes, Your Honor. Today, 22-year-old Isabella Herrera pleaded not guilty to gross vehicular manslaughter while intoxicated and driving under the influence of drugs. The prosecutor says she was high on marijuana at the time. Isabella's attorney says she's from Washington State, but she's been here because she was going to college and recently graduated. Rafael's family saw her for the first time at today's hearing. I feel sorry for her her family. It was a tragic situation for both of us, both of our families. Beto says he last saw his brother just two days before he was killed. He said, you know, have a good day and we love you. Yes, we love you. Never thought that would be the last time. Yeah, never. Isabella faces a maximum of 10 years in prison if convicted. For Rafael's family, they're still realizing they'll never see their brother again. I go to some supermarket and I hope to find him there. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes I hope it was like a misunderstanding mm -hmm. and I get the feeling that he's there, mm -hmm. but uh, no, he's not there. In Vista, this is Anna Laurel for CBS 8. Thanks, Anna. Tonight, San Diego State is confirming one of its professors has died of Legionnaire's disease. Professor Michael J. Buono contracted Legionella pneumonia in February and died on Saturday. We first told you about the case of Legionnaire's disease last month, which led to the School of Exercise and Nutritional Sciences being shut down. We learned today that is where Professor Buono taught. He had been part of the SDSU community for more than 40 years. In a statement, the school said some students called him the best teacher they've ever had. Colleagues say he cared greatly for his students. The building will remain closed until testing is complete. Legionnaire's disease is commonly spread through a building's water system or AC unit. Carlsbad officials say an electric scooter battery likely caused this house fire on Levante Street early this morning. Fire crews responded just before 6 a.m. and contained the flames to the garage where that scooter was. The Carlsbad Fire Department says the family that lived in the home is now displaced, but fortunately no one was hurt. The solution to the wildfire insurance crisis in California may be higher insurance rates for all homeowners. That's what industry experts had to say while testifying in front of a state Senate insurance committee recently. CBS 8's David Gonferson has been working for you talking to condominium owners whose policies have been dropped due to wildfire risk. This is a sample letter that I wrote to a representative. Over the past six months, condo owner Paula Southwick has written about 20 letters to politicians, the governor, even the president of the United States. I tried to cover anyone that I thought might influence the situation. Farmers Insurance recently canceled its policies covering more than 1,000 condos in San Diego, including 240 condos in the Canyon Park Villas in Mira Mesa, where Paula lives, due to wildfire risk. The condo association was able to cobble together a much more expensive policy on the surplus market, leading to an increase in monthly HOA fees and a huge special assessment on every condo owner. We had to pay $2,500 in order to cover the increase from 47,000 to 600,000 a year in our premiums. Last week, Paula finally saw a sign that her letter writing campaign may be paying off. She saw condo owners testifying before a state Senate insurance committee in Sacramento, including Lisa Meyer in Santee, who also saw huge increases in HOA fees after the policy on her 186 unit complex was not renewed. What makes me most scared is I've had recent discussions with our broker and industry experts, and the prediction is that it will be even worse for our next renewal. The Senate committee heard from the president of the FAIR plan, California's safety net insurance of last resort, which currently cannot cover large condo complexes because the policies needed are above the FAIR plan maximum. California's FAIR plan is backed financially by private insurance carriers. Who's going to pay? 
right? These insurance companies don't have a bucket of money they can just pull from and, and uh, absorb, right? Eventually that money is going to trickle down to the policyholders in higher premiums. If a solution is not found soon, Paula says, people will start losing their condos. This will eventually lead to homelessness and add to the housing crisis. That committee meeting was informational, so no formal vote was taken on any proposals. The California Department of Insurance says expanding coverage options for HOAs is a top priority. David, you've been covering this for months now, hearing from condo owners who have been dropped because of wildfire risk. Where does mitigation work in finding solutions for all of this? Clearing brush and hardening homes did come up at that committee meeting. The state is also promising insurance rates will go down in the future for people who mitigate wildfire risk. No action taken, but we know those condominium owners need some answers and soon. David Gofferson reporting for us. Thanks, David. And remember, if you have an issue or concern that affects you or your community, please email us at workingforyou at cbs8.com. Major progress has been made in the San Bernardino Mountains, where main roads are open again after snow was cleared. Crews are still plowing secondary roads. People who live on those roads have been desperate to get things like food and medication. Cal Fire San Diego crews were able to get diapers and baby food to one family just in the past 24 hours. Being trapped offered new perspective for some happy to get back to work. I get to go to work. I left Sunday to go to Victorville because uh, my, my family lives up there and I was able to go to work Sunday because it was a week and a half that I haven't worked. Right now, mountain communities are still closed to visitors. The CHP is monitoring the roads and checking addresses of people who try to drive in. In Ramona, new signs are up on Main Street tonight commemorating the historic eucalyptus tree colonnade. Earlier today, local leaders in the Ramona Tree Trust and community members held an unveiling ceremony. The Tree Trust petitioned the National Register of Historic Places for a sign acknowledging the colonnade. Trees have lined the colonnade since 1909. There are more than 300 of them. They're maintained and replanted to this day. Still ahead, inflation takes center stage on Capitol Hill. What critics say more interest rate hikes could do to the economy. Plus, they are a relic of the past. Do you recognize these? 30 years later, a video store employee looks back as the store gets ready to close its doors for good. Talking about that forecast now, we do have a chance we could see some increasing rain chances as we go into the second half of the week, kicking off the weekend. And not, done, not just then, also by next week. So all those details are coming up. As renamed by God, Walter, since I'm taking over this plane. Plus a series of scares in the sky and what airline officials are saying tonight.